Okay. So, can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to join today's seminar. And my name is Liang Kuijiang, and I'm a PhD student working with uh, Dr. Han Tang Qing. And uh, I'm glad to be here to host this seminar. And today, uh, we're glad to invite uh, Professor Jeff Sherman to give us a talk. He is a department chair of industry and enterprise systems engineering from URUC Champaign. He received a PhD in system science Engi Engi and engineering from MIT in 1988. He's a fellow of IEEE and EFAC. He received a lot of awards, including EFAC High Impact Paper Award and SF Young Investigator Award. He's also a past distinguished le uh, lecturer of the IEEE Control System Society. Um, today, after these uh, seminars, uh, we will have uh, students' meetings with our speakers from 1.30 to 2. If you have uh, more questions and want to discuss more with our prof with our professors, uh, welcome to join. And one more thing. Uh, we have a full end of these events. Okay, enjoy, and uh, I will leave the stage to our speakers, and uh, let's welcome him. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation, and it maybe it was about more than 15 years ago, last time I was here, and it was a September day, and it happened to be a game day weekend, and just a beautiful hour, and then just really good to be back. Also, getting gas on the way up, I saw that the gas station sold bait, uh, live minnows, and that got me also very excited, so I'm going to have to, to come back with my rod uh, next time. So thanks, it's good to be here. Uh, so the topic is uh, multi-agent higher order learning and uh, Nash equilibrium or versus Nash equilibrium. And uh, this is joint work with PhD student Sarah Tunsi, and this will be appearing in uh, the upcoming uh, NeurIPS conference uh, in a couple of weeks. So the motivation is distributed uh, decision architectures where there, uh, we, and here in ISC, ISYE, we dis study decision systems, and in particular, we're interested in decision systems that involve many decision makers. And this can be engineered, for example, in autonomous vehicle fleets or swarm robotics. It can be societal, so friendship networks, uh, contagion networks, uh, and the like, or it can be hybrid. Uh, human drivers interacting with uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, uh, robot, uh, human robot interaction and the like. And the, here's a handful of monographs that are kind of reflecting uh, different aspects of either engineered or human or hybrid uh, distributed decision architecture uh, settings. And these settings have a very uh, important common feature, and that is, yes, we're doing decisions, but the quality of one's decision depends on the decision of others. Okay, and that's an important feature that's going to be throughout uh, the talk. Uh, so, for example, in, say, routing, we're doing uh, commuting. You want to figure out what path to take from A to B, and your satisfaction with the path depends on who else took those roads. Okay, so it depends on the choice of roads that I took, but it also depends on the choice of roads that others uh, uh, took as well. In opinion dynamics, my satisfaction with my opinion uh, has, par has includes peer pressure. So there's my kind of inherent uh, uh, beliefs, but also there are the beliefs of those who are around me. And my overall satisfaction depends on a combination of the two. In contagion, uh, whether or not I'm going to get infected depends on my actions, whether or not I'm infected or will I get a vaccine, but it also depends on the actions of others. Are people going to socialize when they're infected or not? Are they going to get vaccinations when they're infected or not? Uh, network formation, the benefits of forming friends. Well, it's not you know, what you know, but who you know. It depends on what friends they have uh, as well. And so my satisfaction with my network depends on the friendship uh, that's uh, elsewhere. And area coverage, say one, one of uh, past work of ours was to look at drones to compensate for, uh, for communications coverage. Whether or not to send the drone to a certain location depends on where we sent the other drones uh, to get overall area coverage. They all have this feature of we're doing decisions, but the satisfaction with our decision depends on our decision and on the decisions uh, of others. And this coupled decision aspect makes it a game. 
Okay, that's what game theory is about. And here's a line of uh, a, a monograph on game theory, a bag of analytical tools to help us understand the phenomena that we observe when decision makers interact. So you see that what we've been describing of distributed decision architectures is indeed a game. It falls squarely in the lap of game theory. And this is widely recognized, and game theory is all over the place. Uh, so we have uh, game theory in the Internet of Things, game theory in the law, game theory in climate change, game theory in cyber deception, even game theory in Jane Austen. Okay? And one uh, leading game theorist has said this is the imperial age of game theory. Just we're seeing game theory all around. And there's a recognition of all of these settings that have distributed decision architectures where the satisfaction of one's decision depends on their decision and the decision uh, of others. elements of a game, three main elements, we have the individuals, the actors, the players. I'll use these terms uh, independently or interdependently. So who is there and then what are their choices? Sometimes we'll say actions or strategies. I'll be kind of lazy about that as well. So you have the actors, their choices, but then there's this, uh, some kind of scoring function, the preferences. How happy am I with my choice? But as we said, my, my utility function, we can think in this audience of, a, say, an objective function, um, that function is a function of what I do and of what others do. Both parts are there. And so now a solution concept is now that we see that we're in a game setting, a solution concept is asking what will be the emergent outcome. Okay, what do we expect to see in such a setting where people's decisions depend on what they do and on what others do? And a very widely uh, discussed one is that of uh, Nash equilibrium. So in a Nash equilibrium, uh, it's a phenomenon where everyone's choice is optimal given the choices of others. And so how would we know that we're in a Nash equilibrium? Suppose we're engaged in a game, all of us. Uh, and now ever, let's, let's, uh, we're the actors. We have some scoring function that's in everyone's own uh, head. Uh, and then everyone make a choice. Are we in a Nash equilibrium? So I would go around the room one by one and saying, this is what you did, this is what others did. Do you want to change? The answer is no. Go to the next person. This is what you did, this is what others did. Do you want to change? No. Ask everyone in the room individually, this is what you did, this is what others did. Would you like to change? Do you have regret on your decision? If everybody says no, we're in a Nash equilibrium. That's the idea of a, a Nash equilibrium. Everybody is behaving optimally with respect to, has made a choice that's optimal with respect to the, the choices of others. Now, when talking about a solution concept, actually that's a model, okay? And it is not a, uh, a recommendation, where it's the difference between making decisions and modeling decisions. And so in this uh, audience in particular, let's look at a single decision maker. What we do a lot is we make decisions in, in, in ISYE. And so let's say we're optimizing. We have a choice set, we have an objective function, and we want to maximize that objective function. And then we go take classes in linear programming, convex programming, integer programming, dynamic programming, you name it, programming, on how do you compute the best decision to optimize our utility function. Now, all of us can do that, but the question is, is that a good model? If you were watching someone making a decision, we would use our education to tell them what you should do. Uh, but is that a good model of what they will do? We're now a passive observer. Will they do this? Is modeling someone as an optimizer a good idea? And it sounds reasonable enough, but actually it's uh, been analyzed and there's a lot of issues with modeling someone as an optimizer. For example, what if the problem that they're optimizing is computationally intractable? A supercomputer can't do it, but I'm gonna assume that this individual can do it. And so I wouldn't want to model someone as an optimizer if they're solving something that's very complex. Even if it's tractable, polynomial complexity, that doesn't mean an individual can solve it uh, as well. So we have uh, things like bounded rationality. There's cognitive or various biases in how humans make uh, decisions. We have a tendency to uh, overestimate or underestimate uncertainty in events. If we asked us to generate a string of, uh, say, coin tosses on a fair coin, you can tell when a human's doing it because they underrepresent low probability uh, events. 
uh, there's uh, evidence to say that when you ask the same question, but with two different phrasings, you get a different answer. All of these are phenomena that are kind of, uh, observed. And so to model someone as a optimizer comes with its own uh, caveats. And now Nash equilibrium is saying everybody's an optimizer. All of those things that were there for a single individual are there at the multiple decision maker level. And so it's, it's kind of contributing to skepticism of why would think a Nash equilibrium will emerge. So here's a widely cited uh, example of, uh, uh, of a game and, and its, uh, its relationship to Nash equilibria. And you may have seen this before, so it's called the beauty contest for historical reasons. So everybody choose a number between zero and 100. And the rules are as follows. I choose a number between zero and 100. Give me your number. I'm gonna take the average of everyone's response and then take half of the average. And whoever's closest to half the average is the winner. You got it? Okay, you got it? So let's not just do this conceptually. Let's, let's here you go. <laughs> I have uh, six pieces of paper. Okay. Take one. One. One, two. Department head pressure's on, okay, oh, yeah. okay. So you know the rules. Okay, pick a number between zero and 100. I'm going to get all the numbers, I'm gonna take the average, then I'm gonna take the average and divide it by two. And whoever's closest to the average divided by two is the winner. So you can write it down, or let's be on the honor system here and just don't cheat when others say it out loud. Okay, so give me over here your number. What's, what's your number, just don't cheat. Well, you can't cheat because you're the first, okay? <laughs> what? One. Oh, it's very strategic. Twelve. Twelve or 1.2? No, no irrational numbers. Okay, so just <laughs> 12? Twelve? Twelve. What's that? Twenty. Four. Four. Twenty-four. One. And da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> this is the average. Who has said six? Okay, there you go. All right. Yes, absolutely. All right. So what's the Nash equilibrium of this setting? Okay, the Nash equilibrium is when nobody has regret over their choice. In this setting, whoever was the high number is going to wish that they didn't say that, right? There's no way the high number is winning. And what's the situation where nobody is the high number is everybody says zero and it's a tie. Okay, even if everybody says 10, then one person can undercut the others and be closer to, to the uh, half of the average. So the Nash equilibrium is everybody says zero and it didn't emerge. So now we want to, even in a simple case, even if you knew about this example, I would, guess, I would guess that you were not gonna say zero, even if you know the Nash equilibrium is zero. So here's some illustration of experiments uh, from a paper a few decades back. Uh, they, they had people do this in rounds. We just did one round, and that's the histogram of the first round of choices. Uh, so the numbers between zero and 100, okay, there's always a jerk, and somebody said 100. Okay, that's just, that's always gonna happen. Even this structure has, these first round responses have a structure to it. You can say, do the conceptual experiment of, if everyone is random, then the average will be 50, so I'm gonna guess 25. But if people are thinking in those terms, then I'm gonna guess 12, because half of 25 is that. But then if think, people are thinking in those terms, it's six, is that what you did, or? Wow, all right, so you just did level, level two thinking, it's called, level, there's level zero, level one, level two, and then you got six on, on half of a half, okay? That's amazing. So that was the first round, but it wasn't an Nash equilibrium. This is now fourth round versus third round. And this, if it's below the diagonal, what does it mean? It means that people's fourth round choice was smaller than their third round choice. All right, uh, so we still have our friend who said, uh, who's, who's not uh, cooperating, but you see everyone's uh, choices is now kind of drifting towards zero. So although zero didn't appear in the first go, through repeated intera uh, interactions, we see that there's a drift towards zero, and so what we see is that, yes, we didn't see Nash equilibrium, but dynamics can lead to Nash equilibrium, and that leads to now this field of uh, learning and evolutionary games. So here's a quote from uh, the famed the economist uh, Arrow. The attainment of equilibrium requires a disequilibrium process. 
The word equilibrium is really weird to someone who studies dynamic processes because you start with the dynamics and you ask what's the equilibrium. But this said, here's Nash equilibrium, but what's the, what's the dynamics? We didn't define dynamics to talk about an equilibrium. So this quote is saying, we need some kind of dynamic process to have faith in before we have faith in uh, Nash equilibrium. And there's a wide body of work in this uh, area as well. Uh, population games and evolutionary dynamics, uh, evolution and the theory of games, strategic learning and its limits, uh, social dynamics. Uh, it's a, a major contributor was Bill Sandholm here at the University of Wisconsin before his untimely passing a couple of years back. And so here in this work, uh, the shift of focus is away from equilibrium and towards what are plausible stories about dynamics that can lead uh, to equilibrium. So as I said, it's a very extensive literature and the literature uh, can be capsule, uh, encapsulated in this matrix. The rows of the matrix are types of games. Okay, and there's all kinds of uh, potential, weekly, acyclic, contractive, zero sum, general sum, two player, n player, the like. The columns of this matrix are different learning, uh, learning rules. Okay, so what are learning rules? Best response, better response, noisy versions, fictitious play, regret matching, gradient play, we'll talk about that, payoff based, higher order, all of that. Rows, columns, and then you take a type of category and a type of learning rule and you fill in the cell of this is what's going to be the outcome. And the outcome might be Nash equilibrium, the outcome might be uh, uh, correlated equilibria, coarse correlated equilibria, stochastic stability. The outcome might be that something won't happen, convergence won't happen, we will see chaos. Or the outcome might be that, uh, that th th what we're trying to do here is not uh, universal. And so if you ever played Mad Libs, you can play a, a learning and games Mad Lib of just give me a game, give me a learning rule, and then this is going to be the outcome. And a lot of the theorems look like this. For this type of game, or for this type of learning rule, this is going to be the outcome, and we're gonna do some Mad Libs. So here's a simple illustration, again, to complement the, the beauty contest game. This is congestion. People have to pick the high road, the middle road, or the low road and they want to minimize the congestion that they experience, and the congestion is a function of the number of vehicles that take those roads. What's the Nash equilibrium? Nash equilibrium is when nobody regrets the road that they chose. So in other words, I'm not going to be better off switching roads. So in other words, all roads look the same. They have the same congestion. Nash equilibrium, this is also called wardrobe equilibrium in the transportation uh, literature from, from decades back. And so now here's dynamics. We're gonna pick a, a, a driver. That driver is going to switch to a, the road that has less congestion and then uh, repeat. And so this is what the uh, kind of uh, the animation of, of the evolution of the congestion. You see it evolves to equal congestion on, on these roads. And this is the meta theorem. For this specific setting, for potential games under best response dynamics, player actions converge to Nash equilibrium. We just saw an illustration of that happening in this uh, specific uh, case. So we're going to focus now on, uh, on something called uncoupled learning. We'll define that in a moment. We're going to focus on a flavor of Nash equilibria that have been particularly problematic called mixed strategy Nash equilibria. And then we're going to talk about something called higher order learning and say what can happen and what can't happen. So uncoupled learning, uh, un uncoupled learning, this is now coming from uh, the perspective of modeling or providing a plausibility story even, not even a model. Just if we want to believe in Nash equilibrium, we need a dynamic process of how they got to Nash equilibrium. And so we'd like to put constraints on what these dynamic processes can be. And the dynamic process cannot be let's get together and, share and uh, take a game theory class and compute the Nash equilibrium. So we want to put different constraints on the learning process. And so one very natural learning process is called uncoupled learning. In uncoupled learning, my learning behavior can depend on what you do, but not why you do. I have a utility function, you have a utility function. My learning rule cannot depend on the parameters of your utility function, all right? So let's see an illustration in just straight optimization with a single decision maker. So this is gradient ascent. Gradient ascent, my current choice, my next choice is my current choice plus a step size upwards according to my gradient. 
This is multi-agent gradient descent. It's the same rule. What's the difference is that my gradient depends on my choice and your choice. Is this an uncoupled learning rule? Yes, it is. I can de depend on what you do, but I can't depend on why you do it. My learning rule does not depend on U2, the, the function U2. So if you happen to be at a particular X, I'm doing the same thing. If you're with me or against me, I'm doing the same thing for your value of X. So this is an uncoupled learning rule. We can depend on what someone does. Uh, we can depend on uh, the, the other's strategies, but cannot depend on the utility function behind those strategies. All right, those are uncoupled learning. Yes, please. In this setup, yes. And so there are other kind of, uh, back to that big matrix, there's something called payoff base, where you only measure what, uh, what's the reward that you just got. So if we talk about that in terms of, of commuting, one will be, I'm able to observe the choices of all the other drivers. Another setting, which is called the bandit setting, is I take a road and I see how much time it took me. That's all I measure, okay? Uh, those are two different settings. Here, we're, we're assuming that. Uh, yeah. So in the payoff based version, in the bandit setting, it's uncoupled because I'm only measuring my, my, my score. Mm -hmm. So now there's something called mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, and it turns out that uncoupled learning and mixed strategy Nash equilibrium don't get along. So we're gonna look at matrix games, and this is the structural form of a matrix game. Uh, it's a bilinear form where each player's choice set is the simplex, positive numbers that add up to one. So this is what the utility functions look like. Uh, what is a Nash equilibrium? It's each player is using an argmax. For, for your choice of X, I'm maximizing. For my choice of X, you're maximizing. So that's a Nash equilibrium. We pick two vectors in the simplex such that when the other one maximizes, uh, they, they come back to where they were. Each player's playing a maximizer. So let's, what are the Nash equilibria of this game? This is called the coordination game. And uh, it's two players, two actions each. There's two obvious Nash equilibria, and that's when we, let's say it's left and right. When we put all of our weight on left, that's a Nash equilibrium. If I'm playing left, you should play left. If you're playing left, I should play left. If we put all of our weight on right, that's also a Nash equilibrium. If, you're, if, uh, uh, if either of us plays right, the other should play right to maximize. But there's also this mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, where they're playing a balance, a blend between left and right. And what's annoying about this mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is that if I play an, a mixture, you are now indifferent. Actually, your best response is anything. All left, all right, 50-50, you're completely indifferent when I play this mixture. So what's the best response for you? Anything. In a Nash equilibrium, your best response is going to make me indifferent. Why would you make me indifferent? You don't care but you're going to play a mixture that makes me indifferent even though you don't know the coefficients of my utility function. I'm expressing my indifference in a way to make you indifferent and I don't know your utility function. You're expressing your indifference in a way to make me indifferent and you don't know my utility function. So it seems like uncoupled learning where we don't know each other's utility function it doesn't get along well with mixed strategy Nash equilibria and that somehow we're expressing our indifference to accommodate other people's uh, indifference. And it's more than anecdotal. We'll see that there are some fundamental uh, uh, constraints and, uh, or limitations for uncoupled learning. So now back to this uh, uh, quote, the attainment of equilibrium requires a disequilibrium process. Our focus is going to be on mixed strategy Nash equilibria. And our first result is that actually uncoupledness doesn't get in the way. Given any game and any, okay, all of this has fine print, but given any game and any mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, we can construct uncoupled dynamics that converge to the Nash equilibrium for that game and to the Nash equilibrium for nearby games. So it's not a razor's edge thing. There's a built-in robustness, okay? So for any game with a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, we can construct dynamics that work for that game. But it's not universal. For any such dynamics, we can construct a game for which it, those dynamics don't work. All right, so for any game, we can construct a learning rule that converges to the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium of that game. 
for any learning rule within our class of learning rules, we can construct a game that for which those dynamics don't converge. So that's kind of a, a mouthful to remember, so here's what you can take away. Uh, this is a quote from a TV show called The Big Valley. It says, ain't a man can't be throwed, but ain't a horse can't be rode, all right? Uh, so who's the horse in this discussion? Let's say the horse is a game, and the, and the rider is the learning rule. For every game, there's a rider that can, uh, <laughs> for every game, there's a learning rule that can uh, converge to the Nash equilibrium. That's ain't a horse can't be rode. And then ain't a man can't be thrown for any learning rule, there's a game that can uh, derail it, all right? I saw this episode like when I was 10, and like I've been waiting all my life to use it <laughs> in, in technical talks, but now uh, I'm there. So ain't a man can't be thrown, ain't a horse can't be rode. Okay, if, uh, if you, whatever your background is, uh, I'm sure you'll remember this line from the talk, okay? So if someone asks you what's the talk about, you just, just say that. Yes? Isolated, not unique, isolated. Uh, yeah, so isolated is, it's the unique mixed strategy. We're not asking for the Nash equilibrium to be unique. So there may be multiple Nash equilibria, but there's a unique, uh, uh, is completely mixed, completely mixed, mixed strategy that's isolated, yes. That's what we're asking. So that was the case in the coordination game. We had multiple Nash equilibria, but there was a unique, completely mixed, isolated, mixed strategy in Nash equilibrium. Completely mixed, meaning it has rules that are no Nash. Exactly. Okay, so there's a backstory on uncoupled dynamics that kind of launched this discussion. Uh, so the setup here is there's three players, two actions each. So player one is going to pick left, right. Player two is going to pick left, right. Player three is going to pick left, right. Player one wants to be different from player two. Player two wants to be different from player three. Player three wants to be different from player one. Okay, so they can't all pick left or all pick right. They won't be satisfied. This is gonna require, this has a unique Nash equilibrium and it's gonna be a completely mixed Nash equilibrium. And it's easy to compute this is the Nash equilibrium for this game. Now what is bizarre, even more bizarre about this Nash equilibrium is look at the Nash equilibrium of player one. It depends on the coefficient player three, a player that they, they don't even know exists. Player one wants to be different from player two. Player three's action is payoff irrelevant to player one. But the Nash equilibrium makes player three uh, indifferent. It depends on the, the coefficient of player three. The Nash equilibrium strategy for player one depends on the utility function of, the pl of player three who is payoff irrelevant that they don't even know exists. Okay, the learning rule is only gonna be player one looks at player two. And that happens all the way around. Player two's Nash equilibrium strategy depends on a player's coefficients that they don't even know exists. A player three, uh, similarly. They, they don't know they exist and they're payoff irrelevant uh, to those uh, players. So for this particular game, uh, there is a paper that came out now a couple of decades ago, and here's the meta theorem. For the anti-coordination game, under any uncoupled learning rule, uh, strategies do not converge to Nash equilibrium. Okay, it's not specifying a learning rule, it's saying any learning rule. For this particular game, for any learning rule, strategies cannot converge to Nash equilibrium. And uh, what are uncoupled learning? Well, we're gonna talk about gradient play. A blue piece of I is the gradient of that player. There's gradient play, there's smooth fictitious play, there's replicator dynamics. All of these learning rules are uncoupled. They only use the gradient of the, of the player, which can depend on the actions of others, but not their utility. But there's a fine print here, and uh, if you look at these learning rules and think of, about them as dynamical systems, let's count how many states do they have. So each of these, if I have two choices, my learning rule has two states. If I have five choices, my learning rule has five states. And the fine print is that no uncoupled learning will converge to Nash equilibrium as long as they have this dimensionality. Okay, so that's a part that's not apparent from the theorem. It's not no uncoupled, it's not uncoupled dynamics will not converge, it's uncoupled dynamics of this dimension 
which many learning rules have, but its uncoupled dynamics of this dimension will not converge uh, to uh, the Nash equilibrium of that specific game. So let's see, all of these learning rules depend on the current gradient. What if I wanted to have a more sophisticated processing of the gradient? And I'm going to take the gradient and look at the gradient trend and do learning not based on the current gradient, but the gradient trend. To look at the trend, I need auxiliary states. I need some way to store the past, to encapsulate the, the past, to, uh, to react to the trend. And an example that we looked at uh, a while back was we called it anticipatory uh, gradient, uh, anticipatory learning. So I'm tracking the gradient, I'm tracking the gradient, and instead of moving in the direction of the gradient, I use recent history to project where's the gradient going, and then I use that forecasted gradient. I don't use the current gradient, I use the forecasted gradient. Everything else is the same. And it turns out, well, first of all, is that still uncoupled? Yes, I have the same information as I had in the past. It's still gradient. I'm just processing it in a bit more sophisticated way. Uh, so it is uncoupled, and for anticipatory gradient, it turns out that you can converge to the Nash equilibrium of that game. So uncoupled dynamics can converge to the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium of that game that beat them all. It was a horse that beat all of the riders, but only riders of a certain dimension. But if you allow me extra states, and this is what we call higher order learning, if I'm allowed auxiliary states, then, uh, then actually we can overcome what was perceived to be a barrier uh, in uncoupled learning. And now we, uh, well, just some related work. For those of you who do optimization, you've seen this before, of all of these higher order uh, optimization techniques, heavy ball, Nistar of acceleration, optimistic gradient uh, ascent and descent. They use the history of the gradient and not just the current gradient to move in a certain uh, direction. And so there's, you found that this kind of notion of uncoupled uh, or, or higher order learning for games has appeared uh, here and there, and it's getting some more uh, recent popularity. So what we want to show in this talk is that what we just saw for the anti-coordination game is actually is general. Any game with a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium that's isolated, there's an uncoupled learning rule somewhere out there that can work for that game and work for nearby games. Okay. So this is uh, ain't a horse can't be rode. Ain't a game that, can't, that doesn't have learning rules that work for that uh, game and nearby games. So we're going to be looking at matrix games. This is what matrix games look like in the two-player case. We're going to look at the special category of matrix games. It's not really a, a, a severe restriction, but, but they're called polymatrix games. So it's like a player in a network game as players are playing against their neighbors. Okay, they pick one strategy, and their utility is what they garner from playing with each of the neighbors, hence this summation. That's what the gradient looks like. And the gradient, you notice, is a function of only what the others are doing. And a key enabler in what we do is going to write, rewrite gradient dynamics uh, in a way that's not typically written. So here I'm writing gradient dynamics in what I'm calling a, a uh, closed system. And we're, we, we shift it subtly to, uh, all of a sudden, to uh, continuous gradient flow. So my, my, the change, the rate of change, depends on my current value plus a gradient step. Uh, moving in the gradient direction, some technicalities, we have to project that back to the, to the simplex. So this is a closed system. Why is it a closed system? Because we have the gradient built into the dynamics. And this is what happens for gradient play if you're playing a zero-sum game. A zero-sum game with a mixed equilibrium, gradient play will just cycle. A uh, coordination game like the one I showed before, if you put gradient play on that, it's going to zip right by that mixed strategy equilibrium and go to one of the pure strategy equilibria. That's what happens in gradient play. This is gradient play as a closed system, but we're going to write it differently. We're going to write gradient play as an open system. So here's my learner. My learner gets this parameter, this vector. That was the gradient. but Forget about it. It just gets this, this vector, and it moves in the direction of that vector and updates. That's it. This is a now an open system gradient dynamics. Where's the gradient? Well, it's not here yet. It becomes gradient play when we say, where is this vector coming from? 
So if player one has one opponent, that's what that vector looks like. If player one has two opponents, that's what that vector looks like. We're gonna fill in that in later, but we're going to separate the learning, move in the direction of a vector, and where is that vector coming from? And now with that separation, this is what learning looks like. In the top is gradient play, move in the direction of a vector. In the bottom, where is that vector coming from? The top, you notice, is diagonal. That makes it uncoupled. The learners only use where their gradient is coming from. So that's a diagonal system. The bottom is, expresses the game. Whatever the game is, that's going to fill in the blanks. Why is this distinction so important? Well, for me, it's essential because I'm a controls person and I need to see a feedback loop. And now I have a feedback loop and now I can declare home field advantage, right? That's why it's important. I now have a feedback loop and you know, that's it. Uh, we're in charge. So now that we have a feedback system, what does it mean to converge to Nash equilibrium? It means that this feedback system is stable. That's it, all right? So now, instead of talking about convergence to Nash equilibria, let's ask when are these dynamics with the forward loop diagonal, when can they be stable? That the, becomes the, the question. So convergence to Nash equilibrium becomes uh, when is a feedback system stable? I'm not gonna give here the definitions of for dynamical or linear dynamical systems with open loop stability and closed loop stability. It just means what you think it means. Things are converging uh, to where they should be. And not oscillating. So that was gradient play as an open system. Now we're going to do higher order gradient play as an open system. So let's look at this. Here's this vector coming from wherever it's coming. And it's passing through to be feed into gradient play. But now we're going to take what's feeding into standard gradient play and give it this auxiliary variable, something else. So we're going to take what we've been receiving, process it, and add it to the original. So this is going to be the gradient. The upper path is the processed gradient. We're going to take the gradient and the processed gradient and pass that to gradient play. Our processing, so it's an additive, it's an additive uh, alteration to gradient play. And our processing has two parts. You can think of it as a pre-processing to make sure we don't cheat, and a post-processing, which is going to be the sophisticated things like, like anticipation. Okay. How the pre-processing is something in, uh, in our field we call it a washout filter. It has the following property. If what's going into it is a constant, then it does nothing, eventually does nothing. That assures that we're not changing the rules, we're not changing the game. We're interested in convergence to equilibria. This says that if P converges to a constant, what's coming out of here is zero. So the modification will be nothing. Our alteration, our modification is only active when things are moving around. But when things settle, it becomes inactive. Okay, and that assures that the equilibria, if this thing converges, it's converging to an equilibrium of the original game. The post-processing is going to be this dynamical system that's to be determined. Uh, this is what the detail looks like. Uh, there are some other details like our dynamics live on the simplex. The simplex is actually one dimension smaller than, than where it lives. And so we have to do some projections here and there that to ruin the aesthetic of the block diagram. So I didn't include them in, the, in this block diagram. But there's the, you know, the, those details are there. So now, this becomes the new picture. There's standard gradient, which is reacting to a, a, uh, the original gradient and the processed one. And so this is gradient dynamics, standard. Then we're going to pass it through this washout filter to make sure we don't cheat, then pass it through the post-processing, and then send it back. So what's going into here is the original gradient and the processed gradient the no cheat clause, and then dynamic processing. And all we want to ask is, does there exist a diag diagonal system of post-processing? Why diagonal? To make sure it's uncoupled. Does there exist a diagonal system of post-processing uh, that, that, uh, for which that feedback system is stable? And control speak, uh, is there a decentralized stabilizing uh, feedback in, in, in this case? 
And that leads us to the first main result, and that is uh, ain't a horse can't be rode. So ain't a horse can't be rode. If we have an isolated mixed strategy in Nash equilibrium, there exists higher order gradient dynamics. They exist that will converge to the Nash equilibrium of that game and of nearby games. Of nearby games is important because it's easy to create Nash, uh, dynamics that converge to a Nash equilibrium. Everybody go to this point, okay? So we're all just run there. That's cheating because if you change the game, that point is no longer the Nash equilibrium. So it's not a razor's edge. You take the game, you perturb it, it still works. Perturb it a little bit, it still works. There will be a robustness ball of perturbations. So for every game, there exists higher order gradient dynamics that converge to the Nash equilibrium of, of that game. The techniques we use are in the lost scrolls of, uh, of systems theory, okay? And in fact, this result from the 90s is describing earlier results from the 70s and, and 80s. There are linear algebraic conditions that say, when does a decentralized stabilizing feedback exist? And our setting satisfies those conditions. And it's an if and only if uh, condition. So we, we uh, here's the title of the paper that we're using, uh, Decentralized Stabilization for General Proper System. All right, that was ain't a uh, horse can't be rode, but now we're gonna say ain't a man can't be throwed. Given higher order gradient play, we can construct a game for which higher order gradient play doesn't work. And the game that we're going to construct is our old friend, the, the uh, anti-coordination game. And we're gonna change the game in the way that it's strategically the same game. So really these dynamics are not that sophisticated. All we're gonna do is we're gonna change the currency on the utility function of player number three. We're gonna take the utility function of player number three and scale it up or scale it down. Okay, multiply it by 50 or divide it by 100, something like that, okay? And the result here is that if you take higher order gradient play that converges for this game, and scale up the utility function of player three or scale down the, player, the utility function of player three, that learning rule won't work anymore for this game. All right, so any higher order gradient play that works for this game, it's sensitive to the scaling of player number three. Uh, so if you scale it up, scale it down, it will stop working. And the techniques that we use for this are actually techniques that are taught in any junior level uh, controls class, something called root locus, where you track the eigenvalues of, uh, of a feedback system. I told you, converting it to a feedback diagram was very important for me, okay? So now we convert it to a feedback system. This is what the feedback system looks like. It has this parameter, and this parameter can be very large or very small, as long as it's positive, and we see the eigenvalues drifting to the right half plane when it's large. We see the eigenvalues when it's small, starting off in the, uh, to the right half plane, rather, positive uh, real part and then becoming negative real part. So very large or very small, either way, the system's going unstable. Okay. Now, there's a third part that I haven't uh, 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 mentioned yet, and actually I find this to be the most interesting part, okay? And so we want to ask, are there bad horses? Are there some horses that shouldn't be rode? Okay, we can ride it, we know that. Ain't a horse can't be rode. That was, uh, but are there some horses that shouldn't be rode? Are there bad equilibria? Equilibria that we say, you know what? You can learn this equilibrium, but you shouldn't. And in fact, let's look back at a coordination game. Remember we had the two pure equilibria, both left equilibrium, both right equilibrium. This mixture was also an equilibrium is learning this equilibrium reasonable? Well, we've just changed the question to what's the definition of reasonable, okay? So we'll try to make an argument that learning this equilibrium is not reasonable, and we wanna make that argument in a way that's not just pounding the table, okay? Learning this equilibrium is not a reasonable thing to do. So what's reasonable? Let's all agree that, higher, or that uncoupledness is a reasonable constraint. Let's also add some additional constraints. Now we're constraining the learning rule. Now that anything goes, we wanna say no. Anything doesn't go. Uncoupled, we're gonna maintain that. What else do we wanna maintain? And let's maintain something, we'll call it like just basic rationality. Can this learning rule learn its way out of a paper bag? If you gave it a constant payoff vector, 
will it learn the best response to that constant? Not even in the presence of other learners. You're just giving it a, a, a constant, will it learn the best response to that constant? So for example, if the payoff vector is 10, 9, 8, it needs to learn 1, 0, 0 eventually. If the payoff vector is 8, 9, 10, it needs to learn 0, 0, 1. Can a learning, so we're going to say that a reasonable learning rule has to be able to do this. If you gave it a constant payoff vector, it needs to learn what is the best response to that payoff uh, vector. So now reasonable for us means uncoupled and basic, basic, basic rationality. Eventually it will learn the best response to a constant. And then we can show analytically that any learning rule that learns the mixed equilibrium of, a, of this coordination game is not reasonable. It's uncoupled, but it can't learn its way out of a paper bag. It works in this situation, but if you gave it a constant payoff vector, it won't necessarily learn the best response to that constant payoff vector. Therefore, we can now kind of argue this is a bad equilibrium. We have no business learning this because any learning rule that learns this is necessarily internally unstable. And uh, again, uh, the tools that we're using are in the ancient scrolls of systems theory. Uh, we talked about stabilizing a feedback uh, loop. There are results out there that ask, when can you stabilize a system with a stable system? It's the system that itself is stable. Do I need instability to stabilize? And there are some cases where the only way to get produce stability is through instability. We don't want unstable learners because they can't even learn a constant uh, 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 payoff vector. So that is the implication of instability. We have the washout restriction. If P goes to a constant, Y becomes zero. That's only half the story, okay? So I kind of told a half truth. If Y goes to zero, we want U to go to zero. But if that's not the case, then, then uh, well, what do we need for that to happen? We need this system to be stable. And these results say, if you wanna learn the uh, mixed strategy equilibrium of a coordination game, the post-processing has to be unstable. And if it's unstable, it can't even learn uh, the best response to a constant. It works for that game, but it can't learn the best response to a constant. So uh, that's it, really. Uh, what are the main results? A higher order gradient play and can stabilize mixed equilibria. That's ain't a horse can't be rode. Uh, higher order gradient play and destabilization. That is ain't a man can't be thrown. And then are there bad horses? Okay, that there's some equilibria that shouldn't be learned because the only learning rules that work can even not, are not guaranteed to learn the best response uh, to a constant. The tools that we use are things called decentralized fixed modes, root locus and parity interlacing principle. If any controls people are in the audience, you're gonna just wipe away a little tear here because those are the uh, kind of very classical results that, uh, or, or techniques uh, from, from systems theory. And now I wanna kind of underscore what we are saying and what we're not saying, okay? We're not, we're just asking, is this possible or impossible? Is uncoupledness a restriction, yes or no? That's it. So we're not modeling how folks make decisions. We're not uh, designing a system like let's, let's program our swarm robots with this. We're not recommending that. Well, this is not a computational device to compute an equilibrium. We're just saying, can mixed strategy equilibria be learned through uncoupled learning? And the answer is yes. Should mixed strategy equilibria be learned through higher order learning? The answer we saw is sometimes no, because it needs an irrational learner that, uh, to be able to, to do that. So we're only asking what is possible, what's impossible. Let's agree on uncoupledness. Let's agree on basic rationality. Are there other constraints that we want to impose on what constitutes a reasonable learner? That's a future discussion. And that discussion is joined at the hip with what is a good equilibrium and what is a bad equilibrium. And that's all, thanks. has questions? Hi, in these uh, dynamics rules, is the, is the gradient play, is it always a fixed step size? And what do these rules say if the step size 
isn't necessary isn't necessarily fixed. I'm an optimizer, so yes, when yes. we do gradient descent, we like our step sizes to have certain properties. So what I what I had is a gradient size that's uh, that's fixed, yes. and so it's not reacting to that, and that's actually was important for the ain't a horse can't be rode. All we did is we scaled the gradient. And so if it had a, uh, a rescaling, like a normalization, then our destabilization approach wouldn't have worked. Uh, so we used uh, like overreacting, uh, as you know, with, uh, with too large of a step size, uh, then, then uh, yeah, one needn't converge, right? So that we, we took advantage of something like that in the multi multiplayer case. So there is no adaptive step size. An adaptive step size, if it only depended on the gradient and its history, would maintain uncoupledness. And it's to be determined if, now what are the implications of ain't a horse can't be rode if we let the gradient play take advantage of history uh, and, take it, uh, and uh, do some kind of normalization, yeah. Taking advantage, but history is essential. If it was only a function of the current size of the gradient, uh, then it's still uh, unstable in, in, uh, in learning. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for a very nice talk. So when you mentioned about the robustness to the perturbation of your game in the first fast, I was wondering what kind of perturbation you're thinking about there. That, that perturbation is going to be uh, if you just take the game and change the matrices a little bit. So if you change the matrices, you ch move the Nash equilibria, the, uh, the, the, remember there's two parts. There's learning, there's, there's, there's gradient dynamics as an open system. It doesn't care where this is coming from. And then the bottom part was the game itself. So for you fix the matrix, I have a learning rule that works. If you change the matrix a little bit, so just straight plus or minus, the learning rule still works. Yeah. So it's like a, uh, a parameter perturbation, parametric perturbation of the payoff of the coefficients in the matrix game. I will convert to a sequence that maybe sequence the mix matrix. The one that corresponds to the new game, yes, yes. Maybe the last questions. A oh, fantastic talk, and I, I did know the Nash equilibrium to that game, but I, you're right that I knew that zero wasn't quite the right answer, and I was trying to guess what my colleagues mm -hmm. were, were going to pick, mm -hmm. and I under under guessed a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, your department head's very competitive. So. I, <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. um, no, this is really interesting. So, you know, I've you know I've been trying to think about these like kind of unrelated questions that are more related to my research. Um, one is like cybersecurity, where there's like, you know, players can have all different levels of rationality, and it's a, a dynamic environment as well, where mm -hmm. maybe you never converge kind of at all because mm -hmm. the new threats emerge and they just really change the game. And then another aspect, which is, um, I'm not a human factors person, but I'm looking at this other application where there's data and, uh, of like employees, and clearly they learn over time and get better at the job. And so their ration, maybe not rationality isn't the right word, but their skill level improves. And so the players aren't actually the same in the game mm -hmm. at the end versus the beginning. And you mm -hmm. kind of uncovered that a little bit in your, in that example, um, where different rounds of the game, people kind of start figuring it out mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. get smaller and smaller numbers. And, um, those applications that you gave at the beginning, I thought were really interesting, and they, those systems are very different. <laughs> and um, I was just giving you an open-ended question. You can answer mm -hmm. however you want, and then we'll talk later about kind of some of the insights for these really complex application mm -hmm. areas. So let me respond to a few of the points. Uh, one, in terms of, uh, of players being more sophisticated in their response, uh, you see all over the place that people are reacting to trends and like, okay, we're, we're on the other side of the, uh, the, of the uh, pandemic, supposed to be, and, uh, and w when you look at how reactions were in the early stages, there's a certain number of infections. If you take that number of infections and divide it by the population, it's zero, but the fact is that it came, those small number of infections came in a short window of time. So we're reacting really there to a trend, not into a percentage. A lot of learning rules only look at percentages. What's the percentage of the population of rocks, papers, and scissors? They look at percentages, but they don't look at what happened recently and amplify as a result. So this kind of anticipatory learning where we're looking at what happened recently, uh, now a small number of events in a, sh a, short, in a short amount of time 
uh, doesn't reflect in terms of a percentage, but it does impact reactions. And classical learning rules don't use that. So the in introduction of path dependency, I think, is an important one. I think it's an important one even when people do things like agent-based simulation. You don't have to change the incentives. You just change how people react to incentives, how agents react to incentives, and qualitatively different uh, outcomes emerge. And I think that's a kind of a neglected uh, aspect. Regarding cybersecurity, the connection of games and, and zero uh, to cybersecurity and, and just uh, has been well established and it's still ongoing research. There's a group in, uh, in particular in, uh, in Harvard that's looked at it's a very simple, not even learning setting of just using uh, leader follower Stackelberg games to design things like patrol routes to, to uh, combat poaching or patrol routes in an airport. Uh, to uh, combat uh, whatever bad activities happen in, in, in airports. And so using kind of game theoretic formulations. And there, in that work, they're also using the biases of humans uh, and how we're bad at making uh, randomizing uh, to have come up with something that's even more strategically uh, effective against, uh, than it would be against the machine. So these kinds of things are, are uh, emerging. The third aspect was uh, of your question was the open-ended part was 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 you had to, you talked about history you talked about cybersecurity and there's a third element to your, your question of uh, Human factors, all right, right, right. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that comes in the last part and it's something I'm very interested in and just what are the layers of saying what constitutes reasonable or not reasonable. So in fact, the anticipatory was motivated by such considerations, although not uh, based on data, just more based on intuition and pound the table. But uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's another part. So you want to design, th I guess you're talking about that players become more sophisticated as they play uh, and that's, that would be changing their learning rule, actually, to have a more sophisticated learning rule. Uh, and, and I haven't explored that. I think this aspect of more sophisticated learning rules is more, more uh, important now than it was in the past. If you look at a lot of the literature and learning in games, they're very simple learning rules. But now we're deploying algorithms that are open-ended in, in learning. Uh, and so there was a paper that appeared a couple of years ago uh, that looked at reinforcement learning for revenue maximization, a pricing algorithm, and they found that two learning algorithms learned to collude. Okay, uh, they weren't programmed to collude, they learned to collude. And uh, so the algorithms that are being released into the wild are much more sophisticated than simple hill climbing and gradients. And so I think, uh, or when you talk about the human factors part, here's another connection. There's a lot of work in taking data, deploying a technology, and people changing their behavior after the technology has been deployed. And so there needs to be an element of predicting how the human is going to react uh, when the new data uh, gets, uh, uh, when the new technology uh, is deployed. And, and human modeling of, of, of uh, human adaptation uh, plays a big role in that as well. Yeah. So this was much more kind of narrow than, than the, the, the broad challenge that you've, you've, uh, you've kind of suggested in, in your comment. Uh, this was uncoupled. Barrier, yes, no. <laughs> okay, uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Okay, uh, there will be uh, graduate students uh, meetings from 1.30 to 2. If you are, have questions, welcome to join. Okay, uh, this is the today's seminar. Thank you, everyone.